Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Doug. Welcome to First Baptist Church on this muggy Sunday morning. Let's open our service in prayer together. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to meet um, after there have been times in the last year when we haven't been able to, and there are people around the world who cannot meet freely in churches. And, and we thank you, Lord, for this privilege and this freedom that you've given us to come together and to worship you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be an encouragement to each other, that we would lift each other up with the things that we say. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be high and lifted up by our worship, that our worship would be pleasing in your sight. I pray, Father, that you would uh, speak to our hearts through your word, through prayer, through singing and worship. Meet us where we are and whatever we've brought into this place, Lord, that may be weighing heavy on us or causing us concern, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to lay those things at your feet and to give them over to you and to entrust you to God of the universe that you will look after and you will take care of that which concerns us. Just be with us this hour, Lord. Uh, may we leave this place in some way different than the way we walked in. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. this picture. I stole this from a friend's Facebook uh, feed. It's a picture that she took when she and her family went uh, hiking in the mountains in, uh, um, out west. I'm not sure if they were in Calgary or BC, but uh, just getting up into those, some of those mountains. And uh, this is a picture of, uh, you can see her son in the foreground, and then if you look way up, 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 
you can see in the red her other son and her husband, their dad. And I just absolutely love this picture, partly because they are, you know, they're, they're trying to get somewhere. They, they've set their, their sights on the top of that mountain and they are gonna get there. They're, they're working hard and she said, it was really a lot harder than they expected it to be. And they were so glad when it was time to go back down again. But a lot of what I like about this picture is the fact that the dad up at the top, he's, he's facing down the mountain. He knows where the top is. He knows where they're headed. He can probably see the spot where they're gonna stop when they get there. But he has stopped and he has turned around and he is waiting and giving advice to his kids who are following him on this difficult path. And this picture is just so Jesus to me because Jesus knows the path we are on. He has been on this path. He has walked it all the way. But still, he has provided for us and he continues through the Holy Spirit to provide for us the guidance and, and just the perspective and the encouragement, keep going, keep going, keep going. So we're going to uh, read a scripture passage, a combination of two scripture passages, actually. And then we're going to sing some songs that I think help to drive home for us um, the ideas that we find in these scripture passages. The ideas that, that God never leaves us alone, that the Spirit is with us wherever we go, and that there is a path even when it's hard to see a path for us to follow. Let's read these scriptures together. Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Can carefully consider the path for your feet and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. Your eyes will see your teacher, and whenever you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear this command behind you, this is the way, walk in it. Yeah. 
We're going to take a look this morning at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, starting to read at verse 14, going to the end of the chapter. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how practical it is. Thank you, Lord, that something written 2,000 years ago is so relevant to today and to our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you would show us something that we can apply to our lives today. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Ephesians is one of many letters written by Paul to the various churches that he had established throughout the known world in the years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, in many of those letters, like Galatians and Philippians and Corinthians, he's he's addressing certain issues that had arisen in the different churches. The churches had written to him, or he had gotten word through the grapevine as something was going on in that church. Maybe they, there was a te people teaching heresy, people teaching a different gospel. Maybe there was just different people ca causing trouble in the church and breaking up the unity in the church. And, and so Paul wanted to write these letters to kind of help set things right, to, to help the members of these churches follow the gospel of Christ and help them live out their calling as Christians. Now, the book of Ephesians is, is a bit slightly different. It's interesting because it's more of a, a general epistle, a general letter. It's providing a broad theology of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be the church. Many scholars believe that Ephesians, even though at the beginning it says to the church at Ephesus, many scholars believe that it was meant to be something broadly distributed, that it wasn't just dealing with certain issues that the church of Ephesus was facing. It wasn't just meant to be written just to them, but it was to be passed around to all the churches. It would deal with issues that impact all churches and all Christians. And as such, Ephesians is a book of the Bible that can be studied today as a letter that it's written to us, as general as it is, to the church of Jesus Christ in 2021. I mean, all of the New Testament is written to be applied to us today. But if Ephesians provides, uniquely provides a solid theology, a solid foundation for the Christian life in all ages, in all eras. Many commentators see the book of Ephesians split into two. Chapters 1 through 3 are primarily Paul teaching. And then chapters 4 through 6, it's Paul making application of that teaching to, our, to the life of the reader. And in the middle of these two sections is the passage we read today, where we find Paul offering up a prayer for his readers. And considering the general nature of the book of Ephesians, I think we could take this prayer and apply it to our lives in Christ today. Paul is not only praying for, for that one church that he's connected with, but he's praying for all who are in Christ, all in future generations, right down to today. So let's take a look at this prayer and receive it as a prayer for ourselves. Receive it as a prayer for you. Receive it as a prayer for our church. First in verse 16, Paul prays that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The source of the results of Paul's prayer is out of God's glorious riches. In other words, as we see elsewhere in this passage, God has all the power necessary to accomplish what Paul is asking for here. And what Paul's asking for is that we might be strengthened in the inner being, in the inner person. 
So what he's praying for here is not physical strength, not that we would go out and work out more, but, but inner strength. He prays that we will have strength of character. He prays that we will have a strong conscience that will lead us in righteousness. He prays that our soul, who we really are, will be strengthened day by day. And that prayer for strength is in the passive tense. It's not something that we accomplish on our own, like we would work out for physical strength. It's something done for us, something provided for us. Inner strength, spiritual strength, is something that is given to us by God. It's something only he can provide. Now, does this mean we just sit back and, and do nothing in order to strengthen our Christian life? Well, I don't, no, I don't think so. It's important that we put ourselves in places where God's strength can reach us. It's important that we spend time in prayer and in the scriptures, quality time with God that he can use to build up our strength in the inner being. It's important that we spend time in meaningful fellowship with other Christians, that we use our spiritual muscles to share our faith with others. We must put ourselves where God can reach us, but, let, but that the results rest with him. He is the one who puts his prevailing strength in us so that we can have the inner strength to resist temptation. We can have the inner strength to, to deal with tragedy and disappointment, have the inner strength to live out the life that God has created each one of us to live. The strength in the inner being comes as a result, the scripture says, of God's Holy Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. There are a couple of things about the Holy Spirit that I think we can take for granted sometimes. First, we need to realize and understand that when we become Christians, when we open our hearts and lives to God by faith, when we accept his forgiveness and welcome him into our lives, he literally, not metaphorically, but literally does come into our lives by the Holy Spirit. His Spirit is constantly with us, guiding us in all truth helping us remember what God has taught us in the past so that we can apply it today to specific situations. The Holy Spirit's within us, giving us what we need to conquer fear and be able to share our faith with others. The Holy Spirit wants to be active in our daily lives, strengthening our inner being, making us more like Jesus. And I think sometimes we can take the Holy Spirit for granted or ignore the Spirit or, or even actively work against what the Spirit is trying to do in our lives because it might interfere with what we want to do in our lives. And the second thing that I think we don't always acknowledge about the, about the Holy Spirit is the Spirit's power. His power is the source of the inner strength that we receive. It's not achieved through our own resiliency or the power of our positive thinking we are strengthened in the inner being by the Spirit's power. The Greek word used to describe the Spirit's power here and elsewhere in Scripture is dunamis. It's the root word from which we get the English word dynamite. The power of the Spirit is not simply there to make you know, minor adjustments in our lives here and there. The power of the Spirit is living within us to blow things up to make radical changes in the way we live, to lead us into holiness and righteousness. Through the Spirit's power, God wants to help us get rid of our old way of life and to give us the strength to leave that old way of living behind and, and move forward in power to live the way that God has created us to live. Paul's prayer in verse 17 asks that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith may dwell in our hearts. And the term heart represents the core of who we are. Paul isn't praying that we, you know, just allow Christ to have, you know, occasional visits to the core of who we are. He's not praying that we just let Christ hang out with us on Sundays. This isn't describing like a timeshare, like a time-limited rental situation. His prayer is that Christ may dwell in our hearts, that he may take up permanent residence at the core of who we are, that everything we say and, and do and think would involve Christ, would revolve around Christ. To welcome Christ in our hearts, to dwell in our hearts, is both a one-time commitment and an ongoing day-to-day -day living out of that commitment. Just as a married couple commits to dwell with each other on their wedding day, 
They also have to live out that commitment every day and and work out what it means to, to dwell together in unity, to dwell together as one. So when when we welcome Christ into our lives, it's not just something that's limited to one prayer or one baptism, but it's an ongoing decision to to welcome Jesus into the center of our being, to tell him, Jesus, make yourself at home, grab a chair, kick kick your feet up, this is your home. To give Jesus free reign to every room in the home of our heart and not to keep rooms locked up for ourselves. The basis of the relationship we have with Christ as he dwells in our hearts is love. The love he has for us. The love that we have for him as, that grows as our relationship deepens. Paul uses two words that kind of mean the same thing but, but paint two pictures here for his readers. First, he prays that we would be rooted in God's love. And this is an an agricultural picture, a picture of roots going deep into the ground to provide stability for the plant. Roots going deep into the ground to provide nourishment for the tree. Paul's prayer for all of us is that the roots of our lives would go deep into God's love for us that would provide the stability and the nourishment that we need. The second word in the NIV is that we'd be first rooted and then established. And this is more of an architectural term in the original language, giving the idea of a strong foundation for a building. A building without a strong foundation will eventually crumble. It will not stand the test of time. I was standing outside last week, I think after the service with someone, and we were looking at this building and how solid it's been built. It was built over 150 years ago. And my comment to that person was, this building ain't going anywhere. (laughs) Nothing's going to knock this one down. It has a solid, solid foundation. And as we are rooted and established in God's love, as his love is our foundation for life, then we can live a life that ain't going anywhere. We can stand firm in Christ and not get distracted, not get drawn away by the enticements of this world. Being rooted and established in love, Paul prays that we might have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He says we do it together with all of the Lord's holy people. This journey of allowing Christ to live in our hearts, to dwell in our hearts, of building a foundation for life upon Christ's love is something that we do together. Lone rangers, do-it-yourselfers, most of the time do not do well in the Christian life. We need each other. We need each other to help us grasp what God wants us to know, what God wants us to do. We're called to experience God's love together, to show God's love to each other, to grow in that love together. And together we are to experience the Spirit's power so that we can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Years ago, when I was in my 20s, I used to lead the children's ministry at my home church with my trusty guitar. And we would sing songs together. We used to sing a song that had actions, like sign language, like Ruth was teaching us earlier in the pandemic. And we would sing, Jesus' love is very wonderful. Jesus' love is very wonderful. Jesus' love is very wonderful. Oh, wonderful love. And then we sing, so high you can't get over it. So low you can't get under it. So wide you can't get around it. Oh, wonderful love. And then we would do it fast, faster and faster. That was the fun part. The kids by the end would be high, low, and just, you know, going nuts. Simple, simple children's song, but so true and so deep. God's love is so wide that it is inescapable. Nothing, Romans tells us, can separate us from the love of Christ, love of God in Christ Jesus. And his love is long. It's lasted for all of time and it will last into eternity. 
And his love is high. His love lifts us to heavenly places in Christ Jesus, lifts us above this world and the world's ideas of what love is all about, the world's ideas of who we're supposed to be, lifts us up to see things from the way God sees them, builds in us a godly worldview. And his love is deep. We often sing a chorus, our song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. It reaches deep within our hearts as we allow Christ to dwell in our hearts. And it changes us from the inside out, molding us into the image of Christ. God's love is so deep that it's impossible to fully comprehend it in our human faculties. Yet Paul's next prayer for us is what sounds like a contradiction in terms. That we might know God's love that surpasses all knowledge. To know something that surpasses all knowledge, how do we know something that's beyond all knowing? Scientists spend a lifetime delving into the mysteries of the universe. They no doubt understand that they will never come to a full knowledge of all that there is to know. Even in their, their very specific field of study, They'll never know all there is to know within their lifetime, and yet that doesn't deter them from the quest for knowledge. Though they will never know and understand fully, they continue to pursue whatever knowledge they can attain. And we cannot fully understand God and his love for us, but that should never deter us from wanting to know Jesus and his love for us more and more and more. And as he roots us and establishes us in his love, we will know and understand it far more than we ever could have imagined. God will help us grasp how wide and long and high and deep his love for us. And as we engage in this journey to welcome Christ to dwell in our hearts, as we allow him to make the roots of his love sink deep into our lives, then the result will be, as Paul prays, that we will be filled with all the fullness of God. This doesn't mean, as some might think, that we'll become like little gods in ourselves in obtaining God's fullness. God wants to fill our lives with himself so that we can be made more and more into the image of Christ. So that we might experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that we might grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, so that we may exhibit the gifts of the Spirit, so that we might be enabled by the Spirit to be witnesses of the gospel to those who do not know Christ within this, our circle of life. The goal is the fullness of God in our lives. As Paul said elsewhere about himself, he said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. For as we fill our lives more and more with God and with the things of God, there is, le there is left less and less for self, less and less for selfishness, less and less room for the things of this world. It's the rule of displacement. If we're wondering why sometimes it's so hard to live the Christian life, why is it so hard sometimes to resist temptation and obey God's word? Why it, does it, why does it seem so easy to get distracted by the world's ways of thinking sometimes and away from God's purposes for our lives? Well, the answer to resolve this isn't to try and fight harder on our own strength. The answer is to put ourselves in a place where we will experience the fullness of God and his fullness in our lives will push out the other stuff and leave no room for things which draw us away from God's purpose for our lives. Paul finishes his prayer with a sentence that's often used as a doxology, as a benediction, a prayer of blessing used at the end of a church service. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen. We need to grasp the fullness of what's being prayed for us here, what's being promised. First of all, we're reminded, reminded again that God is able. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. There is nothing that is beyond his capability to work for our good and for his glory. And his ability is at work within us by the Holy Spirit. God is always ready and willing to work in our lives as we allow him to dwell in us. So God is able, but we are then told that he is able to do immeasurably more. This one phrase 
it pays for all my, my Greek courses in Bible college because I just like how it's written in the original language. He uses a word structure here, Paul does, that he only uses one other place. It's a word structure where he uses two superlatives back to back to describe God's abilities. It's like saying super, super abundant, super, super, you know, two great superlatives back to back. What God can do is not just beyond our scope of imagination, it's beyond, beyond what we can ask or imagine. Think of the greatest thing you would ask God to do. His ability is beyond that. Think of the biggest thing your imagination can dream up. His ability to accomplish is beyond, beyond that. God's desire is to surprise us as to what he can do in our lives, how he can strengthen us in the inner beings, surprise us at how the Spirit's power can work in us, surprise us at how deep the roots and the foundations of his love can go in our hearts, surprise us at how much he can fill us with himself. So does this mean that if he's able to do all we can ask or imagine, or beyond all we can ask or imagine, then all we have to do is ask him for something and imagine it and then we'll get it? Well, no. God works both for our good and for his glory. And the more Christ dwells in our hearts, the more he takes up permanent residence in our lives, the more he is at the core of what we say and do and think, then the things that we'll ask and the things that we'll imagine will line up with what he wants. They'll be the things that he wants to accomplish in us and what he wants to accomplish through us. Our mindset, our worldview, our perspective, our dreams and our imaginings will line up with God's. So we ask for what he wants and we imagine what he imagines. But even then, the extent to which he will respond can still be beyond, beyond anything we could ask or imagine. We mentioned earlier that sometimes we take the Holy Spirit for granted. I think sometimes we also sell God short in terms of what he wants to do and what he can do in us. I think he's, in this passage, Paul is saying that as Christ dwells in us, as the Spirit guides us, that it's okay to dream big. And I don't really mean big ideas that we kind of think up for ourselves, but rather the dreams and the ideas that God plants in our hearts, whether they're for ourselves or our families or our church. And as we lay these dreams and these plans at God's feet, it's, it's more than okay to ask for immeasurably more than we could possibly imagine. Now, we don't want to be presumptuous, getting ahead of God and thinking, well, we know God's heart and mind when all we really have is just our own wishes. But while we don't want to presume to know what God wants to do, we also don't want to limit God. We sometimes look at the mountains in our lives, the obstacles, the trials, the troubles, and we think, well, what, what can God do? God can't make a difference. Maybe he's not interested, or maybe, he's not, maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's not powerful enough to do something about it. But the challenge this morning is don't put any limits on God. Don't put any limits on his dunamis on his power to shake things up and change things for our good and for his glory. Don't put any limits on his love, a love so wide and long and high and deep that, that though we can grasp all the love we need, we'll never be able to grasp all the love that is available. Ask God to do beyond. Ask him to do beyond beyond. Open your heart and ask him to do what seems impossible, to do something more than we would think could be done, and then leave the results to God. And if the results might be slow in coming, don't give up. And if the results are different than what you expected, well, don't be disappointed. For God often works not only beyond our imaginations, but often beyond our expectations. Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? 
Father, we thank you for this prayer that Paul has recorded. For the believers of his time, for the believers of Ephesus, and for the believers of today. And Lord, I pray that each one of us here would make you, would allow you to make our heart your home. That you would let us not, that we would let you not just visit occasionally and hang out once in a while, but that our lives, the core of who we are, would be your permanent residence, and that all we say and do and think would revolve around who you are. Thank you for your power, the power of your Holy Spirit that that wants to work in our lives in powerful ways. And Lord, forgive us for the times when we're just afraid of how you might shake things up if we turn it totally over to you. Help us, Lord, to trust your love and to know, Lord God, that even when you do want to shake things up, it's because of your love and care for us and because you want to do so much more in and through our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your love that is so high and so wide and so deep. And thank you, Lord, for your power and your ability to do beyond, beyond what we could ask or even imagine. Lord, help us to step outside our comfort zone, even just a little bit, to begin to think and imagine and dream what it is you can do in and through our lives as we welcome you to dwell in our lives, what it is you can do in and through this church as we allow you to dwell here and to move in our lives and to lead us and guide us. Lord, I pray, Lord God, and I ask that you would help us to take this prayer to heart and that we would see it answered in our lives in the weeks and months to come. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.